Welcome, you guys. My name is Matt LaFleur, and I'm fortunate enough to be presenting again this year with Beth Fountain and Jean Walsh, fellow FA community members and both licensed social workers. Seeing yourself as the hero in your own story is called narrative therapy, which can be a healthy way for us to see ethics of our own lives in a non-threatening way. Today, we're going to talk about the hero's journey and how it's evident in our lives with that vein. Each of my co-presenters and I will center our talks around a central question that uh, we'll ask you to think about and then we'll open the question for anyone to think about after the talk. So our point is that heroes aren't just fiction in movies and comics, in, in books or in stories. We hope to show you how the hero's journey applies to you. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Hamilton, and I wanna ensure that we make sure that we're taking care of ourselves during this time. So as we talk today, if things are triggering or they get to be too much, or you need to kind of move, feel free to pause this recording and take care of yourself. So if you notice if your heart rate increases or you're just starting to feel a little tense, maybe take a break or take a pause because your care matters in all things. Hi there, I'm Jean Walsh. I am a social worker as Matt said, but I'm also an FA patient. I've had FA for about 40 years, or I was diagnosed, I should say. We're just going to have a strength-based discussion because in, in layman's terms, strengths are things that are really positive for you, that are asset, that help you along in your hero's journey. Um, we want to continue to build relationships with each other. We importantly want to normalize the conversation around mental health. Though this whole discussion is therapeutic in nature in that we're giving you things to think about that you might be able to build from your strengths upon. Um, this this session is definitely not intended to replace therapy. Back to my friend Matt. Thank you, Jean. So again, my name is Matt Lafleur. I was diagnosed with FA when I was nine years old. My grad school degree is in mental health counseling, but after graduation. I took a contract position, writing as a patient columnist for Friedrichs of Texian News. And that developed in a full -time, into a full-time role at its parent company, BioNews, where I currently serve as the Associate Director of Patient Engagement. A shameless plug, if you like existential literary and psychological and psychological musings on life with FA. Check out my column on FA News called Little Victories. I will share how I relate to one of my favorite superheroes, Spider Man. Even though Peter Parker looks very heroic in the picture in front of us, he didn't always <coughs> I'm sorry. He didn't start out that way and probably didn't see himself as a hero, just like me, and probably just like you as well. Back in high school, I was beginning to feel the grip of FA on my life. I realized that I couldn't hide from, from getting more and more disabled, which scared the crap out of me. There's no way I would have believed that one day I'd be co-presenting a breakout session on mental health 
at the F.A. Symposium. Often, the hero's journey is unpredictable. I'm not patting myself on the back when I say the hero's journey applies to all of us in the, in the F.A. community. Next slide. So the hero's, <coughs> the hero's journey was first coined in the book The Hero with a Thousand Faces by Joseph Campbell in the 1940s. The hero's journey is a similar path that is followed by mythological figures, by superheroes, and by literary characters. Without going into too much detail, the hero journey can be summed up in three phases. The inciting event, or the departure, comprises the uncomfortable change that sets us, <coughs> that sets us down a new path. Next is the conflict, or the initiation, when we confront the major challenge in our lives. Finally, we have the resolution, or the return. That's when we confront the challenge and move and when we confront the challenge and triumphantly return to our lives before the challenge confronted us, but with newfound bravery and wisdom. This is a, this is a really simplistic of few and there are many more steps in the hero's journey. <laughs> so so if you're interested in that, I highly encourage you to check out Campbell's book. But recognizing the hero journey is cyclical and not linear is essential. So what that looks like is that even when we feel like we're back at the beginning and we should be over something, we're just going through the process. That's just part of the journey. And you're still a hero. Next slide. Now I'll go back to Peter Parker or Miles Morales for you modern, modern people. The initiating incident was probably the spider bite. <laughs> that was the world shattering an uncomfortable event that changed Peter's life course and made him begin the hero's journey. In the F.A. world, what is our call to adventure? It's not spider bite, but it's likely our F.A. diagnosis. But again, because the journey is cyclical, that may not be the only exciting event. We may feel ourselves back at the beginning over and over. Some some other inciting incidents in our lives may be adapting to a new walking aid. Or dealing with symptom regression. Or finding ourselves frustrated at trying to access treatment for a pain. It may feel like we're back in the beginning. And we may feel like failures. And even though the cycle is very frustrating, it's completely normal. The call to adventure always takes the wind out of our sails and makes us feel lost. But it's important to remember that you're not alone when you're feeling that way. Next slide. It's embarrassing how long it took me to recognize the power and the unity <coughs> within the FA community. Whether or not you count yourself among friends at events like the FA Symposium or any fair events, I want you to understand that you're not alone. That for the first time, maybe, 
You're around people who completely understand what you're going through. Feeling alone in the world with your fate is really common, but it doesn't need to be, especially when you surround yourself among people who you know understand what it's like. So know that among the FA community, you're no longer a lone vigilante web slinger, but you're an avenger around other superpowered people. Next slide. And now for the question at the heart of my presentation. How can we remain steadfast and be okay with FA? Remaining steadfast means not being swayed by what we're feeling in the moment, but having the same outlook on bad days as on good days. The FA Committee, the FA Committee has an overwhelming task. We have to be okay, despite the joyous eyes and devastating, but Unfortunately, common loads of our disorder. In that case, remaining resilient and steadfast is indeed heroic. Remaining steadfast at all times is almost impossible. At least it is for me. But I think it's an important goal that we have to set for ourselves. It's especially important to remain steadfast right now in this pretty chaotic time in the life of the, the FA community. When treatments are finally available to us, or let me say some of us, but it can be overwhelming. We have to worry about the cost, the availability, and even the potential side effects of any treatment that may come out. Even aside from those worries, life with FA in general can be quite overwhelming. And unfortunately, there is no objective way to remain steadfast. So there's no key I could tell you that this is what you have to do. You have to find out for yourself. What makes you feel alive and happy, even amidst FA's highs and lows? Beth will give us some tips on self-regulation next. And who can you turn to for support, both friends and family, and for professional, for professional guidance? Jean will give us some insight on relationships. <laughs> Please think about this and ask yourself the question. Because we'll ask, we'll leave asking you to think about that. What will it take for you to be okay and remain steadfast in the life of that pay? Next slide. I'll wrap up my section with a quote by Christopher Reeves who was Superman himself. He became paralyzed and wheelchair bound in 1995. A hero is an ordinary individual who finds the strength to persevere and endure in spite of overwhelming obstacles. Persevering and enduring can be another way to say remaining steadfast. For me, that can look like keeping up with exercise and staying physically active. Finding time for me to write and finding ways to stay productive. <laughs> also connecting with friends, both within and outside of the FA community. In, clo <laughs> In closing my session, if you're like Spider-Man and like me, you don't see yourself as a hero. But maybe we should. 
from superheroes to saving the looking glass. Now I give it over to Beth, who reminds us that we're all a little mad around here. Beth. Thank you so much, Matt. I really appreciate that introduction and the hero's journey conversation, which has just been very empowering, I know, for me to hear. If you want to hear a little bit more from Matt about the hero's journey, please check out the Two Disabled Dudes episode where Matt LaFleur is on and talks about the hero's journey. He might not promote himself as much as I will promote him, but it is incredibly powerful and I encourage you to check it out. So my name is Elizabeth Hamilton and I am a licensed social worker, but more importantly, I am the mom of an FAR. My daughter is 11 years old and she was diagnosed when she was eight. And so when we started having this conversation around the hero's journey, and um, kudos to, to Jean Wall, she said, hey, I don't really do superheroes, but I love other things. It made me really think about what story do I connect with and what hero's journey do I connect with? And for me, Alice in Wonderland or Alice stepping through the looking glass really resonated because there's so many times I find in this FA journey that I am chasing the white rabbit, whether it is balance, whether it's a cure, peace, parenting well, um, I find myself running down a lot of rabbit holes. So when we think about going down that journey of the rabbit hole and that journey of shifting lives, my perspective has changed so much and it continues to change and adapt. And so for me, I'm constantly recalibrating, which is why when um, I started working for Bio News and writing for FA News, um, Bio News is the parent company for FA News, I really thought about naming it recalibrating because I'm always rethinking how I look at the world and look at life because things did shift for our family and for myself. So for me, I spend so much time trying to understand. I don't understand medical terminology. So I find myself struggling to understand the research, the doctors, my child, my non-FA impacted child, myself. And at times it really feels like I'm learning another language. Our brains though are incredible and we process so much information. In fact, we're always thinking about things. So right now you are looking at the slide and you're listening to me, but you also could be thinking about what you're gonna cook for dinner tonight or the groceries that you need to purchase or what's on your to-do list for later today. And so you're processing that information and also listening to me. It's incredible the amount of things that your brain can consume and come to snap judgments. And we're able to do that. It's a survival technique. So let's engage in just a quick example together. And it's not gonna be the same as when I do it in person, but just, Bear with me for a second and do it. So I'm gonna ask you this question. What color is this? You're going to say white, right? What do cows drink? If you are like most people, you now have said milk. Whether you said it out loud or in your head, you snap to that decision very quickly. This is white and cows, obviously that's milk. We move to those spaces so quickly. It's really powerful and it's a way of survival for us but the truth is cows don't drink milk, they drink water. We also make those snap decisions when we talk about mental health or our struggles. When I struggle with my mental health or my ability to regulate or my stress level or depression, and I admit it and seek help, that is not a form of weakness, that's a form of strength. That's me being honest. So just as cows don't drink milk, even if we see the color white right before we're asked that question, it's also not a deficit to seek help or to address our mental health. It's a sign of strength. And I want us to rethink that, especially as caregivers and as patients who are going through some challenging things. So as I've had to rethink life, I've had some things that I thought were going to be true in the parent journey that are no longer true. The future is different than what I would have originally thought. And so I'm now rethinking what that preferred future and that preferred now is. And it is better if I own that the roses are white than trying to paint them red. Because when I try to make things exist that do not exist anymore or want things to be a different way, I really struggle with this thing we call self-regulation. So... This is why I have to talk a lot about mindfulness, grounding, and regulation a lot in my column because it is something that I struggle with. I struggle when I get frustrated. I struggle when I don't self-care. And then those triggers come in and I am not the preferred parent that I would like to be or the preferred person. So I want to talk a little bit about the stress response. And this chart is fake. 
but the concept is real. I stole the concept by Dr. Bruce Perry. If you want to read into his stuff, he is a brilliant psychologist, neuroscience um, professor, but has done a lot around trauma in the brain. But if we think about for a non-trauma impacted person, when you wake up and you don't have that stimuli stressing you out, your journey from the beginning here where you're kind of calm and regulated to that stress response where you freak out, right? And we've all had those moments is much longer. If you are a trauma impacted person, you start higher. If you were significantly impacted, there's a very short distance between your waking in the day and hitting that point where you can no longer self-regulate or calm down. I'm not sharing this because it's a deficit for us. I'm sharing this because I want us to, to look at each other in spaces of grace and understanding so that we recognize that we are all going through so much and our journey really requires a lot of self-patience. Another way to explain this is to talk about your brain. And I, I borrowed this from Dr. Um, uh, Siegel, who really did this great hand model around the brain. And it's the best way for me to understand it because I need simplistic things to understand. So if we think about your hand, this is your brain stem. Right here in the middle, your thumb would be your limbic system. That's your fight, flight, or freeze zone, right? We all have talked about it. We've all experienced it, but this is where your emotions are housed. And this part of your brain is incredibly smart. It was created um, in order for you to survive. So it's, it's really smart with survival and getting your body to react quickly. It's not the best with complex conversations, which is where we need your cerebral cortex or the fingers of your brain. So when we're nice and calm and regulated, we're walking around like this, right? Our cerebral cortex is engaged. We're all calm and we're able to hear and respond in ways that, um, not only are healthy or helpful, but sometimes appropriate, right? But it's when we hit that stress response where our brain flips and our thinking brain shuts off and the survival smart part takes over. Survival smart does not mean good conversations, right? And we move into that fight, fright, flight, or freeze zone. I will tell you as a parent with a child with FA, when I'm talking to medical professionals, this part of my brain wants to take over. It is not a good part of my brain to be interacting with people. So what I have to do is constantly think about how can I stay calm? How can I self-regulate? So the smart part of my brain is the part that's interacting with people. So what are some things that we can do to help self-regulate, help stay calm, help to take care of ourselves because we matter? The first is around healthy relationships relationships, those are incredibly important. And that discussion is coming. Movement, movement really works. One of the things that we used to say when we were working with providers who were going to work with kids who are trauma impacted was if you want that child to talk, put them in your car and go for a long ride. Because when we are moving and we're moving alongside people, we regulate, we calm down and we connect so much better. Get yourself in a routine, do something every day to take care of yourself. It should be number one on your checklist. Have some self-awareness. So when you are starting to get stressed out, your shoulders are tensing up, your breathing is getting shallow, you know, and you're aware so you can pause to take care of you because you matter. And the last piece is really around mindfulness, being present to here and now. One of the doctors we work with says you can't parent in the past. You can't parent in the future. You can only parent in the present. You can also only live in the present too. So try to stay where you're at today. So I want you to kind of walk away, always providing yourself with some truth, patience, and grace, because that is critical in this journey, knowing that we're all a little mad here around here in whatever way that looks like for you. And so my question of what I would like people to think about is what is something that you can do that helps you, what helps you feel grounded, helps you feel calm and helps you regulate. Knowing what those tools are for you and what works for you is an incredibly important part of your journey. And with that, I will turn this over to my incredible colleague, Jane Walsh, um, to talk to you about relationships. Thanks, Beth. Um, so I'm Jean Walsh, this is me. Um, as you, as those of you who know the Lord of the Rings thing, um, you can recognize that Lord of the Rings is really where I identify with that story. Next slide, please. We, your friendly panel, and many social scientists think that romantic 
relationship is overemphasized. So we're going to focus on some other relationships today. It's easy for me to say that the romantic relationship is overemphasized because for those of you who knew me, I've been married for 28 years, so um, easy for me to say, I get it. But um, if you can focus on other stuff, that'd be great. Next slide. As you can see, one of my favorite heroes is Legolas from Lord of the Rings. I admire and try to emulate his ability to be the hero one minute and the sidekick the next. Today, we're going to talk about two critical relationships. One is our relationship with our doctor and other medical professionals, and two is friendships. Next slide, please. Let's start with our medical professionals. I don't know about you, but I always find myself super tense when I go to the doctor's office, even doctors I love. So I'm trying really hard to bring the open brain that Beth talked to us about, but um, sometimes I don't bring that brain. I... I've been to hundreds of doctors and diagnostic visit, as many of you have. Many of these have been scary with life altering, altering diagnosis handed out. My initial diagnosis with Redux Ataxi can be summed up in this list. FA, no treatment, no care, realtor by 25, dead by 35. And for contact, I was 19 when they were supposed to be just starting out. Oh yeah, if possible, you should really want to take care of your feet. Next slide, please. What? My feet? How about my life? Not saying ignore, anyone should ignore their feet, but that wasn't the problem in front of me. And so, so it was really insensitive. My parents and I were zombies. At that time, we weren't calling it um, trauma, but it definitely was trauma. We were calling it shock. Next slide, please. My neurologist, circa 1981, when I was diagnosed, superb diagnostician, lousy bedtime bedside manner. It is no wonder that I'm anxious going to the doctor. My family and I were given the worst news of our lives at the doctor's office. I wasn't told to shut up, as in this cartoon, but I definitely was not listened to. Next slide, please. Sounds familiar? Your story is probably a little different, but also similar. Worst news of your life at the doctor's office. The doctor is being a good doctor by telling you the truth, but it's still the worst and traumatic news. Next slide, please. Trauma's at the doctor's office is likely familiar to everyone with the FA diagnosis or an FA diagnosis. 
for a loved one. You may not feel you want to or should recognize our FA diagnoses as trauma, but it is. <laughs> don't, don't diminish it. Recognizing it as such gives us power over the patient medical provider relationship. Maybe your diagnosis came with the awesome bedside manner, and I hope it did. I am not saying your doctor is intentionally inflicting trauma upon you. I am saying that learning you or a loved one who have FA is, is a traumatic thing. Next slide, please. So how do we manage this critical relationship? There are many ways, but this is how I do it. I manage it by trying to be a good and likable patient. For those of you who know me, that will be a shock. Uh, <clears throat> not really. Sometimes I gloss over the hardships I have. I almost always follow doctor's advice. I try to treat the doctor as a human being with the life outside of work and outside my trauma. But, you know, when my brain is shut down, as Beth told us about, um, it's hard to, hard to do that. At the same time, not complaining or glossing over things is something I'm trying to stop doing because the doctor can't help me and he probably, he or she probably won't trust me if I don't tell the truth. I have a brutal disease and have had it for over 40 years is normal for me or any of us with the FAA, regardless of how long you've had it, to have issues. Next slide, please. So, I'm not the only one doing the good patient thing. Probably some of you are too. Trust is a fundamental component on both sides of the patient-doctor relationship, according to the literature I reviewed. So when I don't fully disclose what is going on for me, I am not being transferred from my doctor. It's give and take relationship. Conversely, when my primary care physician which this is actually real for me right now, does not look up FAA. I don't find her competent or reliable and therefore trustworthy. Trust, trust for you might encompass more, more than is shown here. Maybe you have your own unique items. One thing you you probably want to think about after watching us is how do you manage the relationship with your medical provider for yourself or your loved one with the FA? Next slide, please. So my favorite quote, part of that big long quote is, you cannot trust us to let you face trouble alone. Because it reminds me of our beloved FA community. I hope you feel that way too. Trust is fundamental to friendships also. Let's take a mini, very mini dive into friendships. 
Some of you may know that the Surgeon General has declared loneliness a public health crisis. Well, the antidote to that is friendship. Next slide, please. It is not your imagination that friendship is more difficult for those of us with F.A. and our loved ones. While there is no research bad specific to F.A., there's a good bit into people with chronic disease and or disability. So we know it's harder. And we have to make active decisions on how to spend our precious energy. Next slide, please. So how do we con counteract the fact that it's so difficult? It can be done. Next slide, please. Here are some simple ways to nurture friendships. Remember, when you're helping people understand, you're not complaining. You're speaking the truth. Don't forget the details. So getting showered and ready to go out somewhere can be exhausting. It can be overwhelming figuring out that the venue or the bathroom are accessible. Or maybe you're like me and the background, background noise makes a busy restaurant super hard. There are many more examples. I'm sure you have some that are unique to yourself. Next slide, please. Actually, Jean, can I interrupt and ask a question mm -hmm. or make a statement? So as I'm reading this, and we've done this how many times together, I thought <laughs> about the fact that I have to think all the time, because even though I have a child that has FA and struggles with different things, I have to continue to pivot to think about how to care for her. But when you talk about helping your able-bodied um, friends understand it shouldn't be on you to explain that because it's exhausting, but at the same time, I don't know what I haven't lived. And so that's just, it really struck me. And I just want to point that out as how important it is to continue to help us understand. And I appreciate that. Yeah, it's hard. And um, people have talked about this a lot of times in a lot of different contexts, right? We don't know what it's like to be a member of a different race or whatever, but we can never, we can never exactly know, but we can certainly understand, but our ability to understand rests upon people telling us what the issues are. So it's hard to be, you know, we have to walk the line a little bit and give people some grace of just like, I'm tired of explaining that <laughs> I can't, I can't hear in a, in a crowded restaurant or crowded space, whatever it might be. Thank but you. That's an excellent point. And I just want to say friendships are super worth it. Um, they give you a lot. They'll, they're hard. You have to work at them, but they're totally worth it. And um, for those of you that know Lord of the Rings, um, Sam on the left, I can never tell my left from my right. I have to lick my hands. On the left here, it is pretty much Frodo's sidekick throughout the whole journey. But um, 
but Frodo could not have made his journey in the Lord of the Rings tale without Sam being there for him and carrying him when he needed to. So, back to my friend Matt. All right. Thank you, Jean. I will just sum up our talk today with these uh, reiterating our questions. Uh, Spider-Man and I asked how can we be okay and remain steadfast with that bay? Then Alice asked, what is something you do that helps you feel grounded, helps you feel calm, helps you regulate? And then Legolas lit, let off with, how do you manage your medical provider or your friend relationships? These are all super important questions that you guys have to think about. So we ask you to reflect on them after this podcast and keep them in your mind. Think about them. And um, before I sign off, I want to thank my friends Beth and Jane for doing this with me. You guys are awesome. And for all of you guys watching, I want you to remember that uh, the reason we chose the topic, the hero journey, is um because of you and that <laughs> remember despite your doubts and despite what you feel that you are a hero and that is true whether you believe it or not so continue being heroic and um yeah thanks so much for checking it out and um yep yeah, uh hang in there and this is matt and gene and beth signing off